Okay, so not only did we want to show that an object has this concept of the center of mass, that location, okay, but we want to show that an object moves as if the net force is applied at that location, the center of mass. So I'm going to show you a video where I have, let's say, something's moving, okay, like this hammer, and if I looked at maybe one spot of the hammer, maybe the tip, okay, that would follow a very complicated path. But if I choose to look at the center of mass, which is this dot here, right there, that dot right there, okay, or how about that dot there, okay, that that dot, okay, which is the center of mass, acts just like our projectile. So that dot just follows a parabolic path because the only force that's acting on the object okay, is its weight, and that weight appears to act at the center of mass. So we want to show that the center of mass of the moving body okay, acts as if the net force is applied at that point. So I'll show you that video. Okay, so to be able to do that, okay, so here I have a top view of, let's say, an air table, okay, like an air hockey table, and I have some masses, and they're connected by a light massless, okay, so the mass of the rod is small compared to the chunks of the mass, okay, so a rigid rod, and let's say I exert a force with my hand, so I give it a quick push right at that point, all right, and I want to know... How does this system act? Well, the center of mass is here, and I'm exerting a force here, all right? What is that system going to do? Well, what if the, um, what if I make the number of particles large, okay? So what if n approaches a very large number so that these things now look like a big solid object like a ruler, okay? So I have Avogadro's number of particles, okay, I have a ruler, and I'm going to apply a force, either at the center of mass, or I can apply a force over here, and, and I want to ask, well, how does this object move? All right. Now, can I write Newton's second law, F equals ma? Okay, well, which m? Because I know I have all different m's up here, right? I have a system of particles, okay? I have tons of particles, okay? And which a would I use? Because I know this stick is probably going to rotate, okay? It's going to start to rotate. So different parts of the stick are going to have different accelerations. So we have to compensate for all the different particles and all the different accelerations that all those particles can have. Okay, so how we're going to do that, I'm going to start with this expression we had previously. Okay, this is for um, three dimensions. Right? And to make the notation easier, instead of writing that, if I sum over all the masses, it's just the total mass. So I'm going to just use capital M for the total mass. Okay, now, this is the, the coordinate or the position of the center of mass. If I want to find the velocity of the center of mass, okay, I just take the derivative of the position. Okay, so that hasn't changed from the first week. Velocity is the derivative of the position. So the velocity of the center of mass is a time rate of change of the position of the center of mass. 
So I'm doing d by dt of that. So I put that in there. That's the, the position of the center of mass. Okay, so m is constant. That comes outside. Okay. All right. This m is constant. Okay, so the derivative moves its way through that m, comes outside. And I'm just doing d by dt of r sub i. Okay, and we know that the, the derivative of r with respect to time is velocity. So d by dt of r sub i is v sub i. Okay. So not only do we have the expression from before, that if I want to find the location of the center of mass, it looks like this. Okay, I go to each object location, multiply by the mass, divide it by the total mass of the system. Okay, um, or I sum up all the mass of the system. If I want to find the velocity of the center of mass, I go to each object's individual velocity, multiply by the mass of that object, and then divide by the total mass, right? Sum over the total mass. So it looks, the, these two look the exact same. Here I'm summing up the, the locations. Here I'm summing up the velocities. So let's say if I had two people walking, or these could be your gliders, okay, moving down a track. So each of these objects have their own velocity, v1 and v2 and they have their mass m1 and m2. Well, there's some uh, location here. So this is the coordinate of their center of mass. Okay, just like the two tennis balls, the center of mass would be somewhere in between. So that's a geometric point. But as these two people move to the right, this point also moves to the right. So that point, the center of mass, also has a velocity, and it's found using that. And so if these velocities change, if these people start to speed up, then that geometric point, that center of mass, starts to speed up. Its velocity changes. So that center of mass can have an acceleration. How do you find acceleration? Time rate of change of velocity. So I'm taking the, uh, the derivative with respect to time of that, of the velocity to center of mass. So I did d by dt of this. So the mass comes outside, the m sub i, okay? That's constant, so the derivative moves its way all the way to that. So the, so the capital M, so the derivative moves with the capital M, moves with the sum, moves with the M sub i. So I'm taking d by dt of v sub i. So the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So the derivative of v sub i with respect to time is a sub i. So the acceleration of the center of mass has that form. So it looks just like r sub i, I mean, the, the location of the center of mass, the velocity of the center of mass, to find the acceleration, okay? I go to each object, take its acceleration, multiply by the mass, and then divide or sum over all the masses, so the units would cancel, and that gives me the acceleration of the center of mass, okay? Now this term, m sub i, a sub i, okay? Newton's second law says mass times acceleration is force, m sub i. So I have m sub i, a sub i, I put in f sub i, okay? But now I have to figure out what is that term? What does it mean to sum up, to sum up all of the forces? So what is that term? Well, let's say I have some objects, okay? They could be like uh, air hockey pucks colliding. Maybe next semester they could be charges repelling and attracting and so on, okay? Or they could be planets, all right? So what it means to add up all the forces, okay? is I take uh, the external force on number one, okay? The external force on number two, okay? If I have five of them, I go up to the external force on number five. Here I have n of them, so I go up to the, the nth external force, okay? But, okay, number one can be bumping into number two. So there's a force on one due to two, and if number one bumps into number two, Newton's third law says that number two must have bumped into number one. So if there's a force on number one due to number two, then number two exerts an equal and opposite force back, okay? If number three bumps into number five, then number five exerts an equal and opposite force back on the three. So I have, I have three on five and seven on eight and so on. So this is the, the ith force. This is the force exerted on the ith particle due to the jth. This is the force exerted on the jth particle due to the ith. And Newton's third law says that these two forces are equal and opposite. That if this one's three Newtons, that one's minus three Newtons. So these cancel, these are internal forces, okay? This force here is minus 
F I J. So these forces cancel. Okay. So the force exerted on number three due to number five is equal and opposite to the force exerted on number five due to number three. So those collision forces are internal to the system. They cancel out. The only forces that you have left that are non-zero are the external forces. So that F sub I in the last expression are the net external forces. So on the previous page, we had summing over all the forces. Okay, That is just the net external force. So if I solve this for F, Okay, that looks just like Newton's second law from the previous chapter, but we have to be really careful. This M is the mass of the system. Okay, the A is the acceleration of the center of mass of the system. So now when we write Newton's second law, we have to be careful. That's the mass of the system. That's the acceleration of the center of mass of the system. Now, when we did the, the dots lab, we had the, the dots glider went down the track. Okay. We found that the acceleration was g sine theta. We did that with Newton's laws. Okay. Really what we're saying is, well, there's the center of mass of the glider. Okay. There's the center of mass of the glider. And the acceleration of the center of mass of the glider was g sine theta. All right. But the glider is not rotating, so that's not an issue. But for things that are going to move and rotate, we're always going to look at the center of mass. So that's why um, the previous lab we did, I, I posted last week, um, you are measuring to the center of mass of the objects. Because for now on, we have to inventory the center of mass. Okay, so here's a top view. I have a ruler on a table. Okay, on an air table, like an air hockey table. Okay, so if I give the ruler a quick push, okay, which is an impulse, okay, so my finger is going to exert an impulse, okay, so a force acting over a short period of time. So while my finger is in contact, while, while the force is in contact, Newton's second law says that if the force is to the right, my finger force is to the right, the center of mass is going to accelerate to the right. So that while my finger is touching it, the center of mass starts to accelerate to the right. Now my finger is no longer touching it, so there's no more acceleration. So the center of mass keeps moving to the right with constant velocity. Okay, But... If I exert my force up here, okay, all right, still using this, while my finger is touching it, okay, while I'm exerting a force to the right, the center of mass starts to accelerate to the right. Now my finger is gone. My finger is not touching it. It's only touching it for a short period of time. So that means that there's no external force or no net external force that the center of mass can, can accelerate. So the center of mass moves at constant velocity to the right. Okay. But the rest of the stick keeps rotating. Okay. So the center of mass moves at constant velocity in a straight line okay. while the rest of the object rotates. So I'm actually going to show you a video on that where um, I have an irregular shaped object. Center of mass is over here. You exert a force on it, and that center of mass is going to move in a straight line while the rest of the object... Okay, keeps rotating. Okay, um, here's a, an example. I have a disc, all right? So disc is on a table, but I have a disc resting on a piece of paper, all right? And I'm gonna slowly pull the sheet of paper. So, and I'll show you a video of this. So I have a, imagine like a tire, okay, I have a disc on a piece of paper. I'm gonna slowly pull the paper and I wanna ask, which way does the center of mass of the disc move? Does this thing move? 
to the left. Okay, so again, you're standing here watching this. Is that going to move to the left? Is it going to move to the right? Okay, or is it going to stay in that spot? Okay. Okay, now, I'll show you the video and we see what happens. So what happens is, okay, when we write Newton's second law, okay, m is the mass of the system, a is the acceleration of the center of mass, right? So I'm going to draw the forces that act on the disk, all right? So I have the normal force, okay? And again, this is where it's important. You now have to draw the forces where they act, okay? You can't just have the disk and there's mg and there's a normal force, okay? Okay, you really have to draw the forces where they act. So normal force goes through the center of mass, mg goes through the center of mass, okay? And I'm pulling the paper. So as I pull the paper, okay, it's the paper that exerts a force on the disc, and that's a static friction force, okay? And I think I showed in the video, or I'll show again in the video, that if I just put the disc flat and just pulled the paper, okay, that'd be no different than hooking a string up to it and pulling it to the right. So it's easy to see there's my static friction force. So in this picture here, my static friction force points to the right. Okay, well Newton's second law says that if there's a net force to the right, okay, that there better be an acceleration of the center of mass to the right. So the static friction force is to the right. So the center of mass, oops, there's my static friction force, my center of mass accelerates to the right. So in the video, you showed that it started here, okay, where you're standing, and it winds up over here to the right. 